In this short video, we're going to start talking about vector functions and their graphs, which are space curves. So a vector function, r of t, let me just make a note. I realize that the uh, notation that I'm using is not as clear as I wanted it to be, so I'm going to really emphasize vector quantities, not only with the different typeface, but I'm going to use a different color and I'm going to underline them as well. So when I actually type something, you'll see something with a different color and an underline and a different typeface, all three of those together indicating that it's a function. I mean, it's a vector. All right, so vector function uh, has an input, which is a scalar. So t, t is just a scalar. And the output is a vector. Now it could be a vector in R2 with two components or a vector in R3 with three components. The graph is a curve. So if it's in the plane, obviously it'll just be a curve in the XY plane. But in space, we'll get a space curve. The F, G, and H are our component functions. So since the component functions are just regular scalar functions, vector functions of a single variable, what we've been studying all along in algebra and trigonometry and calculus one, calculus two, everything that we learn about those regular functions of a single variable, we can use when we're studying these vector functions. So it's really not all that new. Let's we'll see at least one difference. I'd like to find the domain of the vector function whose components are t, radical t, and 1 over t. So if I look at the x component, or the first component, I have f of t equals t. And the domain for that function is all real numbers. In the second component, I have g of t, which is radical t. And that has to, its domain is all of the numbers starting from zero and going to infinity, all of the non-negative numbers. And finally, my third component function is h of t equals one over t. And its domain is everything except for zero. So if I want to ask what is the domain of the vector function with all three components, then I need to take the intersection of those domains. What is common to all three sets? And the intersection of those three domains is all the positive numbers. So everything to the right of zero going to positive infinity. We have to leave out zero because of the third component, and we have to leave out the negative numbers because of the second component. All right, limits and continuity. Well, simple enough, the limit as t approaches a of the vector function r of t is just going to be the vector where you take the limit as t approaches a of each component function. So for example, if I have a vector function with the same components from our previous example, and I'd like to find the limit as t approaches 9 of r of t. Now, let's just remember that uh, whenever a function is continuous, when the limit approaches a particular value, if the function is continuous at t equals 9, you just use direct substitution. And all of these functions are continuous on their domain, so I can just use direct substitution to find the value of this limit. It's going to be the vector t, the, I mean 9, then radical 9, which is 3, and 1 over 9. And our definition for continuity is really just follows directly from what we learned in Calc 1. A vector function r of t is continuous at t equals a, provided that the limit as t approaches a 
of r of t is r of a. And that just follows from if each one of the component functions is continuous at t equals a, then the vector function will be continuous at t equals a. But all three of them have to be con continuous in order for this condition to be true. Graphing vector functions. Well, graphing uh, space curves can be uh, challenging. It's like graphing parametric functions, but sometimes we have the third component. If we only have two, then we use the same techniques that we learned in calculus two for graphing parametric equations. And actually, uh, if I'm going to sketch a graph of a space curve, mostly it's the same, but there's a few other things that we might want to look at to help us in addition to technology. So our first example here is sketch the curve represented by r of t equals t in the ith component plus cosine t in the jth component plus sine of t in the kth component. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just make a table. And this is what you should have done in Calc 2 with parametric equations. You would choose values of t. And in this case, we won't have points. I have position vectors. But so when t equals 0, I go ahead and put in t equals 0 in my component functions. And I get the vector 0, 1, 0. And then I do it with some other values here. And I'm choosing, because I have sines and cosines, I'm choosing pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. And then over here on my graph, I'm going to try to graph those, the corresponding points to those position vectors. So I would have 0, 1, 0. And then at pi over 2, and I elected to use 1 grid line on the x-axis represents pi over 2 units. So then I'll be at pi over 2, x is 0, and y is, I'm mean, sorry, z is 1. And along the y and z axis, uh, I've elected to use four grid lines to represent one unit. Uh, so that uh, it's not just some real tiny graph here. So, all right, so then I'm at that point. And then pi along the x-axis, negative 1 along the y-axis, and 0 along the z-axis. So that gets to me to that point. This would be 3 pi over 2 on the x-axis, 0 on the y-axis, so that I'm down here at negative 1 on the z-axis. And finally, back at 2 pi. So 2 pi. Then I go 1 in the y, parallel to the y-axis, or the y-direction, and 0 up. All right, so I've got a it, you know, things are already getting a little confusing. So before I go further, let me try to connect these points in order. So I start here, I go over to that point, and to there, over to here. And now I've continued a little bit further. Um, so if I go pi over 2 more, I should have the same uh, y and z. So I'd have z 0 for y, and z is 1. So that's how I got to, to this point here. Because now I'm just repeating. The, the, I have a, the uh, y and z are periodic functions. And so I'm just repeating their coordinates as I go to the next multiple of pi over 2. So then at 3 pi over 2, be the same as pi, so I'd be at, yeah, over here at negative 1 and 0. And then one more, I'd be at down here at uh, z equals negative 1. So it is uh, somewhat challenging. It helps to know the final shape. 
And the final shape of this function is a spiral. So it's supposed to look kind of like a spring. If you think about that way. It's a spiral about the x-axis specifically. And I went ahead and used technology to, to sketch it again. So you can see it. Uh, you know, the the it look it's more stretched out here because I had compressed the scale on the uh, x-axis uh, to be able to draw it. But that's what it looks like. It looks like a, a spring going around the x-axis. All right, so let's look at another example. Uh, we're going to find a, a vector function which represents the curve of intersection between the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 4 and the plane y plus z equals 2. Now this happens to be a circular cylinder but remember for us in this class cylinder has that special def definition. We could have an elliptical cylinder, a sine wave cylinder, really any kind of cross section there. Um, uh, for a cylinder, but this is a circular cylinder. So I went ahead and used technology to help me sketch this. So x squared plus y squared equals 4 is a cylinder that goes around the z axis and uh, its radius is 2. And then the plane y plus z equals 2. And be careful about these equations. We're so used to looking at equations like this and thinking about lines, but as soon as we have three dimensions, this type of equation represents a plane. In fact, just for quick review, maybe it's worthwhile talking about that. The plane, the normal vector for that plane has components 0, 1, 1. Remember, it's just the coefficients. I don't have an x, so that's like 0x plus 1y plus 1z equals 2. Now, if I look at it in just the yz plane, so if I look at it straight on from the x-axis, it will look like the line y plus z equals 2. And so uh, here is the plane. And so our curve would be this curve of intersection right here. It's, it's an ellipse. All right, so let's find its equation. Well, just quick review. We have cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. So I can multiply both sides of that equation by 4. I'll get 4 cosine squared plus t plus 4 sine squared t equals 4. So that looks like what we have in our equation of the cylinder. And let me just rewrite that as parentheses 2 cosine t squared plus parentheses 2 sine t squared equals 4, which means I could use x equals 2 cosine t. That's how I get x squared. And y equals 2 sine t. And that will give me my x squared plus y squared equals 4. All right, so that'll give me my first two component functions of this vector function representing this ellipse. What about the third one? Well, we haven't used the equation of the plane. So for any point on that curve, it's also on the plane, we'll know that y plus z equals 2, which means z equals 2 minus y. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the third component. 2 minus y, but oh, I've got a formula for y, so let me substitute 2 sine t in the place of y. So now I've got my third component, 2 minus 2 sine t. So the vector equation 
for that curve of intersection is going to be r of t equals 2 cosine t comma 2 sine of t comma 2 minus 2 sine of t. All right, let's try to sketch this curve. My first component is constant, 1, and then second component is cosine of t. Third component is 2 sine of t. So those are my x, y, and z. I'll write parametric curves. So x will equal 1, always 1. y, though, depends on t. It's cosine of t. And z depends on t. It's cos uh, 2 times sine t. And so then I'm going to go ahead and solve that for sine of t. And why am I doing that? Because I know I have the Pythagorean identity that cosine squared t plus sine squared t equals 1. So in the place of cosine, I'll put y. And in the place of sine, I'll put z over 2, which gives me the equation of an ellipse. And then I can't forget that x equals 1. So this isn't an elliptical cylinder. If I didn't have x equaling 1, this would actually be the equation of an elliptical cylinder. But we're fixing x equals 1. So we have the x coordinate having only one value, which is 1. Now, this is an example of what we call a plane curve. It's called a plane curve because it's contained in a plane. In this case, the plane x equals 1. So let me look at my axes here. I'm using two of the grid squares to represent one unit on all of the axes. And I know for this ellipse, what are the vertices going to be? Well, the x coordinate is always going to be 1. If I put z equals 0, then y is going to equal either positive 1 or negative 1. If I set y equal to 0, then z is either going to be plus 2 or minus 2. So if I plot those points here, I get, well, x is always 1. So y is plus 1 or minus 1. And then z will be either plus 2 or minus 2. So if I can do my best to connect those dots with an ellipse, then I have my plane curve ellipse. And here it is drawn with technology. I'll give you a little bit maybe uh, better view of what it looks like. So this is an, an example of a curve which would be a little bit challenging to sketch uh, by just choosing values of t and substituting them in there. You could do that. You could just go and choose, you know, t equals 0, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 2, 2 pi over 3, just continue and plot those points, but it would be very challenging. So I'm going to suggest that we look at these as parametric equations again. So x is cosine of t, y equals the negative cosine of t, and z equals sine of t. And let's view this as the intersection of some surfaces. So for example, I notice that x and y are opposites of each other. And so I could say this curve is going to be the intersection of the plane, y equals negative x, because everywhere on this curve, y equals negative x. And then I notice that I have uh, sines and cosines. And so x squared plus z squared equals 1. So that will be a cylinder. And also y squared plus z squared equals 1. So if I look at the intersection of those three surfaces, that's going to give me this little elliptical shape. Now, it's an interesting type of an ellipse because 
If I were to look at it from the top, of course, my top view, so looking down the z-axis, I'm looking down the z-axis, I have to be a little bit careful because of the right-hand rule, x is actually positive going down, and this is the y-axis going out to the right, but that, you can see, goes along the line, y equals negative x. And then if I look at it from the side, sure enough, I have this circle that, uh, so I'm looking down the y-axis. The y-axis is right in the center there. x squared plus z squared equals 1. And if I look from the top, from the front, so looking down the x-axis, I get y squared plus z squared equals 1, another circle. Uh, but it's actually just an ellipse. It's just an ellipse there. Here's another view of it. All right, in our last example, we're going to try to find points of intersection between this spiral, sine of t, cosine of t, and t, and the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 5. So again, I'll look at my curve using parametric equations. And I'm going to go ahead and say, OK, let me start with the equation of my sphere, and then I'll substitute in the parametric values for x, y, and z. So that'll get me sine squared t. So I've replaced x with sine, y with cosine, z with t. x with sine, y with cosine, and z with t. Now, I know sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So I'll get 1 plus t squared equals 5. And now it's easy to solve for t. t squared will be 4, so t is plus or minus 2. So that'll give me two points of intersection. So when t is positive 2, my point of intersection will be, well, sine of 2, cosine of 2, and 2. I'm going back to my vector curve to get the first the position vector, but then I'm just converting it to a point because that's what the question asks for. The question asks for at what points of intersection. And then I also have another point of intersection when t equals negative 2. Now I can clean this up a little bit because I know that sine is an odd function and cosine is an even function. So I can write my final answer as sine of 2, cosine of 2, and 2, negative sine of 2, cosine of 2, and negative 2. So we now we know uh, about vector functions, their graphs, and uh, we know about limits and continuity. Our next step will be to, to take derivatives and antiderivatives or integrals of these functions.